Okay, well, um, it's a pleasure today to have uh, Graham Kells with us. So he uh, comes from Dublin's Institute for Advanced Studies. And uh, he'll tell us about uh, using operator quantization to explore topology at high temperatures and in non-equilibrium. So it's uh, quite an appropriate topic and we're looking forward to hearing about it. So please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Zako. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about operator or third quantization and give you hopefully a nice way to view it and maybe show you where and when you can use it. And um, I'll also tell you about a few of the ways that, that we've applied it to address issues of topology in high energy, many body states of, of topological superconductors. And in, in a non-equilibrium setting where we've been looking at an interesting model that blends classical stochastic transport and quantum transport. Um, so, so actually this talk includes contributions from lots of people. So I'll just put them up here and then hopefully I can uh, single some of them out later. Um, and then I should thank our funding bodies as well. So to start this off, I wanna talk about many body physics and what makes life easy, at least computationally. So, you know, in the realm of many body physics, there's quite a lot you can do, of course, without making things too difficult for yourself. Um, it's quite acceptable to stay over here and then do many profound things. And um, most people um, in the field occasionally push themselves out here um, out of their comfort zone. However, I, I've noticed that the class of people who practice this ETH violation business are, you know, like to challenge themselves to all kinds of um, horrible combinations of these things. And, you know, invariably including these interactions. Um, <clears throat> so, if this is the kind of thing you're into, then I hopefully this this is these two things will be interesting, and I'll kind of show you how these two things can be combined together to, to give you lots of information about about this region up here. <clears throat> and so, one of the things we love in in many body physics, of course, is a quadratic Hamiltonian of fermions, and um, if we use a Majorana fermion representation, so these gammas up here, which are just superposition of the normal uh, Fermion, a direct Fermion creation annihilation over The most general thing you can do is, is, is this here. Uh, and uh, we like this because we can make superpositions of these gammas and write down free Fermion modes of the system. And the superpositions are found just by diagonalizing this matrix A, which is only linear and then the system size. And then you know, with these free Fermion modes, you can write down the same Hamiltonian matrix. So it's just the sum of those number operators made from those modes. And these, these number operators basically count whether the mode is occupied or not, and then give it an energy penalty. And so we like this, and you know, we can we can then you know start populating things with the binary representation, let's say, of these of these of these beta free fermion modes. And um, we like this, like we like this second quantization picture. It's nice, we can get every state that we want in the system technically. But if we're in the region where like we break this quadratic uh, behavior. For example, with a four fermion term, like an interaction, then we can't do this, and, and therefore we can't do that. And so we're, we're back here again, at least partially. <clears throat> but I want to show you kind of clearly what's going wrong when interactions are present. And it can be really helpful, you know, to, to, to see this if you, instead of looking at the Hamiltonian, um, study the, the commutator, so the, the super operator, uh, that is a, you know, basically going to operate on something. <clears throat> and so I'll represent this with this kind of blocky e H here. Um, and you know, to give you to give this thing some structure, we need we need to give it an inner product. So we use Hilbert Schmidt inner product. And then um, and then this notion of double kets here for kind of vectorized operators. And then you need a basis. <clears throat> so a really convenient basis is this canonical operator basis of basically made out of all possible combinations of those Majorana operators that I mentioned. And from here, you know, if you have the time, you can go ahead and then calculate this matrix representation of this block EH um, element by element, if, if, if you were so inclined. Um, and assuming that you have a quadratic uh, Hamiltonian, you find that the resulting representation then 
has a block diagonal structure. So, so this, this thing here is, is our block EH now has this type of structure. Um, and interactions are going to ruin that property. So, you know, in, in a very real sense, in this picture, they're like basically like a symmetry breaking term. Um, but I'll return to I'll return to that in a little bit. Um, so, so the nice thing about this block structure is it turns out that that A matrix where you where you defined we used it to define your Hamiltonian that actually just sits right there in that in that corner there. So in the block spanned by linear combinations of Majoranas, and so that means that if you're looking for eigen solutions of your problem, then then your free fermion modes that I mentioned before. Would, would basically just sit in this in this in this little part of the of this larger space. Um, but so and so that's the general idea behind this. Um, and so what we can incorporate you know those those modes beta into this vectorized structure basically by by basically putting them inside this double ket notation here. So we just stick them in here. And so this is really where the, the, the notion of third or operator quantization comes about, because you consider the set of operators or super operators that can create these labels inside uh, a double ket um, here. Um, and so I have to kind of give you an idea. So to visualize this, we could consider the identity state, for example, as or the identity operator as the super vacuum. Uh, and then these blocky C daggers uh, as creation operators that are going to act on this state and then create this other thing over here. Uh, create that mode inside that ket or that double ket there. So in this case, I'm imagining creating an eigen mode creation operator beta dagger inside this structure. Um, so it actually turns out that in this picture, super creating a creation operator is the same as super annihilating an annihilation operator. And so you can basically cancel daggers like that's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> or you can move them between the super operator and the thing that you're trying to create. So you can move them like that. That's the same thing as well. Um, so these super creation operators can be combined in a way similar to ordinary fermionic operators. In fact, really identically to ordinary fermionic operators. For example, here, I've created this beta one dagger, beta two. Um, and it sits within, this one sits within the block spanned by all kind of uh, combinations of two gamma operators. So it sits within this two gamma block. Um, so here's another one, uh, that's the same thing as I was saying, you can just switch the daggers. Um, <clears throat> and the point is that this vectorized kind of eigenmode could have also been found if you just focused on this A2 block. But it's it's nicer to represent it in this other way with this super oper operation or this super super operator creation operators, um, and I guess you know the point here is as well you know the, the eigenvalues that, that you get here correspond to what you would kind of sum up here from the from, from whatever the eigenvalues are from this thing. Um, so this is all pretty neat. Uh, it gives you a nice way to represent complicated many-body configurations and a way to navigate between. The, the local in configuration space in configuration space sense these local kind of modes um, and then non-local configurations which you would associate with actually individual transitions which are always you know eigen modes of the of the commutator um, and you know tend to be supported throughout this four to the power of n dimensional Hilbert space um, so. Yeah, and so the, the way to kind of reconcile those two, two points is to understand that these sums of, so these sums of non-local configurations, um, when you sum them all up, they kind of cancel to give you something that is local to individual blocks here. I mean, that's kind of the reverse way of thinking about second quantization. Um, and so we could call these kind of excitation number blocks, and then we could write this as this, it's the same thing. Um, and so, so, uh, so that's the kind of general picture. I'll, I'll discuss in a bit how you can how you can form a nice representation for all of this um, in terms of spins on a ladder. But before that, I want to just go back to this quantization picture because there's one little subtlety that I want to discuss about navigating the space 
about what happens when you try to super create terms that have creation and annihilation operators of the same fermionic mode, basically. So I showed you how this works, for example, and it just makes something over here. And it's the same for this and oh, this one. And I also said, you know, that they're, they're fermions. So basically, if I just put the same operator twice here, this whole thing just vanishes. And basically, this thing vanishes. And so that you, can, you could represent that, for example, as a null set or a zero in there. Um, but the point that I want to make is that if you have a, if you're trying to create a beta one dagger here and then a beta one here, then uh, over here, which you don't get something that's just local to this two, two gamma block, you get, you get a bit of the identity up here. And this makes sense, right? Because of the fermionic anti-commutation relations. And it means that if you want to create uh, elements that are self-contained within a block, uh, but have a bit of the same fermionic creation and annihilation operator in them, you should, you should do the following superposition. So you use this difference of terms. And, and if you do that, then you, you get what you want in, in, this, in this thing in here. Um, so, and, and that you could write that as, as, as follows. Uh, sorry, it's the same thing, right? As I to emphasize that kind of earlier point. Um, so yeah, sorry if that's been a bit confusing, but the, the reason that you care about this is because you wanna be able to make local in a configuration space sense operators that are in the kernel of this uh, commutator. This blocky e h thing, um, <clears throat> and so that will be important later when I discuss this uh, quantum modified TASEP system. And so uh, I introduced a bit of shorthand. So instead of um, so going back to this picture, instead of just carrying around all these things, we're just going to re replace those with this kind of a z operator. So so that's just that's just the idea there. So this kind of blocky z, and likewise, you know, I just put a z inside the double k. And um, Okay, so the whole point of this was that interact interactions will mess things up. And um, the quadratic term has this clear, if you will, excitation number symmetry, but interactions will break that symmetry. So visually speaking, quartic four fermion terms will fill in these green blocks, connecting uh, one to three to five and, and zero to two to four. Um, and this identification up here doesn't work anymore in this in this picture. I mean, we don't expect that all the combinations of eigen differences between eigen energies will have the same will have the same difference. And so you can kind of, but you could in, in this case you could generalize a bit in the sense that you could talk about one-to-one um, -one identifications between states and of roughly the same value. <clears throat> And then down here, in, you would get something instead of just a single eigenvalue, you would get maybe something like a mean of all the energy differences that happen to be occurring in this sub. Um, and then the, the last thing that changes, of course, is you know, the, your, your modes are no longer local to those blocks. They kind of bleed from that single particle block into the three particle block and into the five particle block and so on. And so you, then you're, you're left with this kind of notion then of, of many body modes. Where you, where instead of just this linear sums, you have all, all triplets, and then five, and then seven, and so on. And so, um, so that's the background basically. Um, so you keep it in mind for maybe twenty minutes or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll first tell you a little bit about how I came across this stuff, and indeed how I blundered around with it, uh, trying to address questions related to what people call strong or many body zero modes. Um, and without realizing that all the formal elements were, were already well known in the non-equilibrium community. And after that, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, let's say the approach of pros and in particular in relation to this boundary driven XY model, how it fits within this kind of pictorial viewpoint. And, and then it's a nice, that's a nice way then to kind of finish up and tell you about our own little foray into, into this non-equilibrium setting and tell you something interesting about this nice model that blends quantum and classical ground work. Um, okay, so um, so where I started to look at this was um, I was looking at topological superconductors, and in particular I was looking at this P wave or Kataev chain, um, and so written down in terms of the usual Dirac fermions, it looks like this thing, and uh, and we were planning to put this order in it, 
where, which means we're going to randomize this potential in a particularly controlled way. And uh, we also want interactions. So we want a uh, nearest neighbor repulsion term. It's basically the simplest thing you can do here. Um, but of course, as I said, we also want to explore the many body spectrum of this thing. So yeah, uh, so again, we're, we're, we're kind of where we are. And then um, the idea of course is without any of those interactions, uh, then we have this well-defined notion of, of these fermionic Majorana edge modes. <clears throat> um, they've been discovered a few times, I think at this point and, and undiscovered at least once. So you know the story. Um, but they're basically these modes that sit on the, on the edge of the system. They're essentially like a single orbital somehow distributed at opposite ends of the wire. <clears throat> um, and uh, they should fulfill certain properties. Um, so the main one that you'd be concerned about is that it, it commutes with the Hamiltonian up to some small, exponentially small in the system length correction. Um, and there's some other properties here too that are important. Um, and generally, all these things imply that the, of course, you know, in the free fermion system, the entire spectrum should be twofold degenerate up to uh, whatever exponential splitting you have due to the finite size of the wire. Um, and, you know, if you write these things out in terms of these outer products, um, you can kind of see how, you know, these things would switch from each state to its parity switch partner. And then keeping in mind that, you know, these, these outer products are always the eigenmodes. If you're a commutator, you get the idea of where they would be zero modes in that sense. Um, so, so generally speaking, um, in terms of the stability of the topological phase, um, both disorder and interactions are bad. Uh, they, they reduce the single particle gap and that leads to an increase in the effective coherence length. And so generally a degradation of topological order. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of work on this and, and there's just a, a kind of biased selection of stuff that I, I know. Um, and so it was surprising then to us and to many when um, you know, various groups proposed you know, the disorder could, could help stabilize topological order. At temperatures above the topological gap. So um, the general idea here is that um, even weak amount of interactions will kind of split this degeneracy up here. I mean the ground state should be fine, but would split the degeneracies here above here. Um, but that if you had enough disorder in your system, um, you would kind of fix this degeneracy again. And so this would be due to localization. And I think specifically they're thinking of very high temperatures. So something like MBL would repair these mismatches. Um, but that discrepancy, you know, is even compounded a little bit more for us by the fact that there was quite a few works around at that point that show that there's regions of the parameter space in which the zero modes are either protected by additional symmetry or at least they're in some way perturbatively protected against the negative interaction effects. Um, so, so this is quite an interesting story. So I'll just digress a little bit. And um, those other results typically apply when either you have essentially a flat band spectrum to begin with, and then you try to perturb away from it. And um, so this, this figure sums it up kind of generally. I hope you can see it. Uh, I'm just realizing now it's not so clear, but the general idea is you can have a complicated many body spectrum, but if you're kind of originating from the same flat band, you can all have all sorts of avoided crossings and stuff here, but the spectrum is still identical in, in, in basically even and odd. So there's always this perfect degeneracy. But when you have situations like this up here, it's a very narrow thing, but there's states coming from different kind of flat bands or with different, let's say, excitation numbers, then, then you can get cases where you get splittings like this in one sector and not in the other. Um, so the, that's the general idea. There's, there's another case that's very interesting is when there's extra symmetry, uh, like time reversal, for example. So Paul Fendley has like, this really nice solution on an exact zero mode in a strongly interacting environment in, in that scenario. Um, so uh, the same kind of perturbative idea can also be extended to ZN parafermions where the N is odd. 
Um, the most prominent point is this chiral pi over six point in the Z3 chain. And so there's some, some of our stuff there on that. Um, there's actually also a really nice connection with, to be made up with, with all of this stuff and pre-thermalization, in particular this paper up here, um, where, they, where they use this kind of theorem to explain all of these things, all of this general phenomenology. Um, and you can also, uh, from there, make this connection with uh, these kind of generalized Gibbs, Gibbs ensembles. So, um, and you can see a lot of this even with the exact diagonalization. So, I have a movie here from a Stephen Nolte made showing this kind of switching between generalized and, uh, and kind of normal Gibbs. I don't know if you can see it, it's like something from Star Trek or something, but it's um, basically it starts off with this kind of generalized Gibbs ensemble in terms of the entanglement entropy and then, and then goes to a normal a normal scenario. And so, <clears throat> um, okay, so that's the digression over. So the main point of this is that, you know, the kind of, that kind of pre-thermal stuff happens over in this region here in terms of the spectrum. Um, and, but in reality where, where this MBL story, if it, if it happens, should be, should be way over here. Um, and so, so that's, the, that's the kind of general idea. So I'll now review the numerical setup that, you know, bring in the, the stuff that I showed you at the beginning. So on the left here, I have uh, the, the P wave wire with interactions. Uh, and on the right, I have assumed a kind of a spectral decomposition of the same thing, but where, you know, I'm, I'm just basically modeling the splittings between the even and odd sectors with these delta N terms. <coughs> um, and so our generalized modes are now gonna be of the form, like I told you, I'm gonna look for something like this. And they're gonna correspond in a many body kind of picture uh, to an outer product like this. And so the, the nice thing about doing it like this is if you, if you then take these, this thing and then plug it into a commutator, like you would hope to, you would see that um, basically if you can calculate these trace kind of things, then in this, uh, uh, with the left and right, let's say Majorana operators, then in this case, you would basically sample the mean splitting between all those states. And in the other case, if you can do a kind of a double commutator, like I showed you here, you can actually get the variance. Um, <clears throat> and ideally, what you want to do is keep all these things intact. And so, you know, these, these are the kind of properties that you want. And it, you might think that these, these last two are essentially the same thing, but, but they're not. And, you know, um, we kind of feel that we were able to implement this one very easily, but this one is very, very hard to implement in practice, at least to actively implement it. And so I think this is uh, one of the reasons why my punchline on this is a little bit less conclusive than we would have liked it to be, but uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, uh, okay. So this is how we do it back. We're back to this picture now again, like I mentioned, we have our, this is what we do. This is the representation that, you know, so you can write out all this stuff that gives you this block structure just in terms of spins, it's, it's quite nice that kind of excitation number symmetry I mentioned before is exactly what you would think it's, it looks exactly like magnetization in this basis. Um, and that's the symmetry that's preserved when you have no interactions, but you know, it's broken by this interacting term at the end. Um, and recall now that we wanna just calculate these vectors U1 and U3 and U5, et cetera. And so, um, when we did this first, we went for a kind of a brute force approach where we really tried to assemble these states by individual elements. But um, what we did eventually was, you know, to try and go to larger systems was implemented with this finite state automata and then, you know, make an MPO for this guy. And the expectation values that I'm interested in are, as I mentioned, were, were basically this contraction of this kind of tensor network here and then which gives us that mean value, and then and then this one here, which gives you this variance, um, and this one here is the is the is the hard one because this is the one that we're actually going to be minimizing when we're doing when we're actually doing your DMRG or your variational approach approach to this. Okay, so the results here. Um, so we examine the first thing we do we like we examine the shape of these these U's that come back when we after this procedure, and and we see something 
pretty nice. You see, for, for kind of the single Majorana configurations, we got something very interesting as a function of the amount of disorder. So I think this is the standard deviation of disorder here. Um, so you can, you, can, you can see that we always have the kind of single particle physics that you expect. You get an increase, at least near the edges, you get an increase in the, in the localization length of the Majorana fermions. So that makes sense. But then for when you have very weak amounts of disorder, you come up against this kind of flat table that's basically given by the fact that there's interactions there now. But as you increase the value of disorder, you can kind of punch through that table at various different rates. And so that in a sense is quite nice for us because that's kind of what we hope to see in the sense that you know, if, if this MBL idea would work, then, then maybe that's what we would see. And so it was very exciting when we, when we were seeing these results, but the, the kind of the, the letdown for us was that when we looked at the, this value, this E2 value, which is this double, tra uh, this double commutator, which is supposed to give us the variance, and um, well, we got nothing. So we got this nice dip and then the single particle effects taking over, basically finite size effects taking over. We got a really like six order of magnitude decrease in the dip in the, in the mean but then nothing in the variance. Um, and so, you know, um, in the context of what we were talking about, we were looking for a better zero mode. Um, and I'll show you, I mean, it means we got a better zero, but not a better mode. Um, so, I mean, we have some error analysis on this. Um, it's, it's, it's in this paper. I, I won't go through it too much. It's basically what we want, but what, what we actually have um, if you really if you really work it out um, in this E1 measure, there's 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 an error, but the error would basically be vanishingly small if you got to a big enough system size. It would just be a sum over kind of random numbers that would be would have zero mean. But the error in the E2 measure um, would be a sum over generally positive quantities, and so that's actually the thing you're trying to get rid of in the in the DMRG, and so we couldn't we couldn't get rid of it. Um, and to kind of give you a pictorial view of what I meant was, you know, if ideally speaking, this was the spread of energies due to the zero of uh, due to the zero mode, in the case that uh, that we had no interaction or no disorder, and but we had some error, this chi two is kind of hiding this the, the true value behind us, and what we see in the in the numbers when we turn on disorder, I mean, we get a shift of this thing back towards zero. And um, the question that we really wanted to answer was, did, did this red line get thinner? Did it become more tightly bound around the middle? And, and, and we weren't able to see that at all. We, we, just, have, we just have this error uh, basically blocking it out. And that could mean that it doesn't happen, but it could also mean it does happen and just the method didn't work uh, in this particular case. And um, so, so that's that story to so boil, boil down. We got a better zero, but not a better mode. Um, it's certainly not finished. I have, I have an interest to return to this actually, not least because of you know, the technological consequences, but also because uh, I think we can certainly get some better answers. We've learned a few new tricks since then. Uh, and so those, those kind of new tricks are in the, the non-equilibrium setting. So that's just the, the last part that I'll just tell you about. Can I ask about these uh, previous results? Uh, Ooh, so yeah. you were picking U to be very small. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was. <laughs> To give ourselves every chance of seeing this this effect, it is a very small U. I mean, we did go bigger, but same, you know, it was very very small, um, and still still couldn't get it to work in the sense. But the related, sorry, a related question is: I mean, if you compare the results, you have to use zero. How different are they? It, when you use zero, basically, these this red line just keeps going straight. Um, there is an effect. There isn't a, like yeah. You, you is absolutely tiny. So, so if you if you were to just cut this cut this curve basically off, here I cut these off at maybe thirty. That's what you see with this order and no interactions. But interactions somehow you know kick in at some point distance from the edge, or at least this is what we think. I mean, this is our interpretation. Like I said, it's possible what we're seeing is 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 not really we're not interpreting correctly. But that's I mean that makes sense to us, but I guess the point here is when, I mean, another way of looking at this is this, this thing here contains terms from the left and right of the system. Um, and so it's a kind of a property. It's a question of 
how far apart are things? There's a question of locality there. But then this measure here, you're, re you're using the same mode on the left kind of twice and then hitting it in here. And so the question of locality is maybe not the most important one here. I mean, I don't know. And so certainly for this E2 thing, we weren't able to see it. Uh, but you know, the other thing I would say is just to go back to that point about those constraints, we weren't actively able to, um, where did I mention it? Maybe it's further on here. No, it's back here. Um, we weren't actively able to enforce this one. Um, and so, and it really does need to be enforced for these things to be really true. So there's that aspect of it too. Um, we have some ideas of how to do this now, but uh, I haven't done it yet. So, but that's a, it's a, maybe something to return to. Um, is, is that okay? okay? Okay, so yeah, so we're going back up here. So, okay, so, so now we're in this, this story about quantum classical transport and we're talking about um, non-equilibrium physics. And so the opening scene is now this master, Lindbad master equation and then the object of interest is this calligraphic L which is the sum of, uh, of the commutator, which we mentioned already, and, and then some, some jump, offer, op, jump operators yet to be specified. Um, so in the same way as before, we give these super operators matrix representation. So this story, I'm gonna only talk about quadratic Hamiltonians. And so in terms of spins, the most general thing, kind of nearest neighbor thing you can do is this transverse XY system, which is here. And you know that's exactly the system we were just looking at, like literally exactly the system we were looking at. Um, and where if you want to map it back to fermions, you know the delta, the small delta is now actually the, the large delta in the previous one. Um, and then the hopping is just given by the symmetric xx plus yy, and this hz is your is your chemical potential. Um, so the question that we want to look at is how do the how do representations of these different types of jump operators how do they appear in this kind of picture, and um, and so um, yeah so we're asking the question what do these what do these block die this these blocks look like for different kind of jump operators, and of course it's worth mentioning that in this non-equilibrium setting we're typically interested in steady states and we want to consider the solution or solutions to the matrix with eigenvalue zero. Um, we're also interested in other states, and in particular, you might care about what's the largest real eigenvalue not belonging, let's say, not belonging to the steady state, which largely, you know, determines the relaxation rate of the steady state. Um, so, so Thomas Prosen considered this kind of uh, transverse XY setup with um, asymmetric boundary driving in, I think, 2008, and this is really where this notion of third quantization comes from. Uh, like the paper lays down rigorously a lot of the things I just showed you. Um, and pictorially, you could say the reason it works in the case of this asymmetric boundary driving is that the off diagonal terms uh, only appear in this lower triangle of this matrix. And that, that means that you can basically still focus on these diagonal blocks if you want to get the eigenvalues and the rapidities. And um, so you can just look at this guy and then generate everything else from that. Um, and indeed, yeah, so, so basically you can focus on this one or this one. Um, and notice and in this story, since we're looking at uh, physical states, of course, we're interested in actually the even parity blocks. So even though we get these rapidities, you're actually interested in what happens here and here. Um, and there's also some technicalities regarding parity and whether or not your boundary driving is, is fermionic or spin. Uh, I'm just going to gloss over that. Uh, I'm, I'm also not going to discuss how you actually make uh, these states um, basically from, from the eigen solutions uh, of, of these, from these eigen solutions. I mean, that's quite a complicated procedure in kind of in a biorthogonal setting and probably best left alone. Um, but using this te technique anyway, so uh, they were able to, uh, or their variant of it, they, they were able to get a pretty clear evidence of topology in the rapidity spectrum. So this picture is from their PRL here. And uh, for those of you familiar with the single particle spectrum of the of superconductors will recognize this, this red curve and, and know what's going on there. 
Um, there's also some nice evidence of topology and the appearance of like, edge modes in the system. But the weird thing is that the phase transition, so this non-equilibrium phase transition that they actually see, doesn't necessarily correspond to the topological phase transition. Um, so this is another picture from them. Um, where they're looking at some correlators, but this is this non-equilibrium phase transition that they see. But the topological phase transition should be just basically this, this vertical line here. And so I have a really nice movie of this. Um, so, um, so this is the gap closing. So you've seen the gap closing. And the first dots that are going to shoot off here are, are basically the Meyer and the zero modes, but there they go and they're gone. And then and then basically something then starts to happen around here, something funny goes on. And then, you know, eventually you might get something else shoot off the edge of the, edge of the thing. And those, those guys there are also evanescent modes. <clears throat> but I mean, the, I guess the point is that Majoranas are playing a role here, but they just get kicked off to very, some very high real value. Um, and then this other transition here is, is, is very strange, but it's definitely something to do with topology because it's, it's something to do with how the the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is bent over in this W shape. <clears throat> um, the, the precise way that these states occur depends on the boundary driving, but, but not, not very much. Um, and so in general, the phase diagram that I showed you, I mean, that only depends on the, on the values of the Hamiltonian. It don't depend on the, on, the, on the jump operators at all. And so that's kind of a little disappointing in the sense that you, what we were hoping for anyway was, was something that uh, where you could kind of mix these two kind of effects like the Hamiltonian and, and the, and the, and the non-equilibrium parts. Um, <clears throat> so the gaps that they see, uh, just, just for reference, are they get this one over n to the power of three scaling and then on the phase transition line they got this one over n to the power of five. So generally for large system sizes, these things thermalize very slow. Um, so the new stuff now that I wanted to tell you about then is this um, XY model with TASEP. And um, so TASEP is this the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. So it's a model of um, it's a many body model of like point like particle flow and has been used to explore um, traffic. Um, and trails, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff, biology, even, you know, mRNA, if you want to get your hands on some of that COVID money. Um, and then the real thing, the interesting thing, and why this is so famous is it has this really cool phase diagram, basically depending on these hop on, there's a hop on rate alpha and a hop off rate beta. And there's a, a rate in the middle, the probability that you would hop forward in the middle, but typically you set that to one. And you get these nice different phases, um, um, and uh, this the this steady state for this model was famously solved for by Derrida and Co. in '93 using uh, matrix product states, matrix product states before they were even called matrix product states. And then, um, and then, so our original idea when we started to look at this was just to see if we could make some quantum version of it. You know, by square rooting the matrix elements, for example, of the of the Markov process that describes this. So, but none of that worked. Um, and but we eventually figured out that we could just incorporate at least the, the stochastic bit directly into the Slimbad type setup. And um, I guess this is fairly well known that you can do this. But but at the time for us it was news. Um, and then we found out that actually this exact thing had been looked at by Thelma Wolf and Verstrata in 2012 but where they actually only considered um, hopping. So, so they had no, they had no uh, delta and isotropy. Um, in this paper, they actually also considered the symmetric hopping process and also show how to incorporate those Derrida solutions into, into the open kind of quantum setup and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I guess, you know, in terms of the, in the, the general picture of our block matrix, where does this type of thing put us? <clears throat> So it puts us here basically, um, and it's fairly bleak at first sight. Uh, I mean, in terms of getting something solvable out of it anyway, but it's not without some interesting features. Um, so to tackle it, we, we employ MPS methods. This is what uh, Tema and Co do. Um, and for the steady states, I guess these days you can use the methods from, from these refs here, where you look at L dagger L 
and then employ some traditional DMRG and whatever other tricks you know how to do to speed it up. Um, there's no great advantage to going to this canonical representation. Um, however, if you look again at the block structure, you'll notice well that one of these blocks is missing. So this guy here is gone and um, it's up in the corner. And of course, it has to be like that. Um, or else basically you wouldn't get you wouldn't get it always get a dark state. Um, but for a kind of a detailed structure of what's happening uh, and what's happening. So this block is gone, but then there's only two matrix elements connecting to it. Um, and so basically, and these, these two things are only are related to the boundary driving. And so we can use them to essentially project out the steady state. Um, and then we can also use something like TEBD, so this uh, time evolved block decimation technique to basically solve for the largest real eigenvalue. So we can actually get the gaps out of this using DMRG as well. Um, so just on a brute force observational level, so you have the ability to get the steady state and the gap. Um, but the structure is also useful on a perturbative level. So um, starting with something like this, where I introduce a small parameter in terms of L, uh, then you find that on a, on a, if you introduce that small parameter and break it up like this, um, you can actually show that on kind of the next order of iteration for your steady state, um, the small parameter drops out, which is kind of weird. Um, so we go like this, we, we turn this into our kind of our unperturbed part and this our perturbed part. And then there's this kind of standard iterative approach you can do to generate these things where you generate the, the jth correction using the previous one. And uh, the way perturbation theory, you typically do it here is you start with this identity. So this maximally mixed state, and then you look for corrections to it. And if you, if you go through this and you go to the limit that this epsilon parallel and epsilon perp are small and equal, then you see that they actually drop out. Um, and that's a bit strange, but, but it fits with what, you've, what you see numerically. And I mean, maybe you've observed this elsewhere as well. So that's nice. I mean, it just gives you a nice way to, to think about these things in terms of the blocks. Um, and if you do that, then you can understand this, this parameter here that appears here in this side, this second block, as kind of a valve for deciding whether the system is far from the infinite thermal state. Uh, so basically, a large OR here would mean that the steady state is close to this maximally mixed state, while a small OR means that it could be very different. Um, and you can also, using similar techniques, at least in this small epsilon limit, show that how the eigenvalues of each block behave, you know, as you as you as you go higher in perturbation theory. And this and these kind of things do have a small parameter in them. And so it basically means that you can you can uh, you can treat you can look at the eigenvalues of each block and then you know understand on a perturbative level how they how they're going to change. Um, and it gives you kind of access to uh, the spectrum of the full Liouvillian in that sense, at least in that limit. Um, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so what do we actually see? Um, we, we found something pretty nice in terms of the gap behavior. Um, when, when you introduce this anisotropy, uh, we, we found that the gap generally scales as just one over n in this model. Um, but that there's actually a constant term that comes in and that basically shifts the gap away from zero in the term of the non Um So that's pretty nice, it's pretty different. Uh, and uh, this offset, however, is strongly suppressed once this transverse field pushes you out of the topological region. So in this sense, the, the behavior of the, of the thing that we're seeing is a bit like a field effect transistor. And so there's a nice connection with uh, continuity equations with sources and things like that. Um, so this calculation here is done from diagonalizing just this L2 block uh, numerically, and it doesn't scale too badly. So you can go with the large systems. So this is about hundred, I think. Um, but the last thing I guess I wanna show you is that we're also making progress on an analytical level um, using this kernel creation idea I mentioned earlier. So, um, if you remember these Z super creator operators I mentioned, um, and you know there's a way to use those basically to make all these make all these operators in the kernel of, of this commutator H, and if you if you do that then you can basically you can make 
all these states, and then you can expand the, the jump part in that basis. Um, and you, you can get an effective, basically, description of, the, of, of, of these models. Um, so I'm quite excited about this because you kind of, you, you, the, these Zs are, or these are something like bosons and you have some effective description of some boson model for figuring out what happens. And the, the properties of these, of these models are usually pretty nice. So you can actually use them to say something that are, are analytic. So um, uh, I think, and also I suppose the other thing to say is I think that this idea probably works generally. Um, yeah, sorry, you can do other, you don't need to just target the kernel, you can target some other stuff as well. Um, but, um, but it's all pretty nice, but I'll, I'll fill in some more details some other time. So I'll leave it at that. So thanks very much. Great, thanks a lot. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, well, maybe I can start. So can you summarize to us so the message of the first part of the talk? Um, so with respect to, you know, the standard kind of story in the literature about this localization protected order. Um, yeah. Do you agree I, with that? Do you disagree? Oh, well, so, I mean, when I first heard about it, in the context of the wire, I didn't think it was possible for the reasons I mentioned. I mean, we had a good handle on, on where, where, what happens when you have disorder and interactions, they're both bad. And so the idea that you would introduce disorder into a system and make it better from the topological standpoint was unusual. But of course they were talking about what's going on up high in, in high energy. And so we we just we just we didn't make a judgment. We just said we'd go after that and try and, and try and get an answer. And um, when we do ED on those kind of systems, you do see if you have weak interactions, you can you do see an effect, you know. But it's small system sizes you're talking about. It's like a 12, 13, 14. You can see it there, and so that that's so in that sense, I I agree it's true. But we we were hoping to be a little bit more ambitious and actually say something about what happens, you know, for large system sizes and hopefully get something on, on the order of like uh, tens or hundreds. And then, um, but we didn't see it. We didn't get, we didn't get any evidence that this tightening of this mold structure happened. But like I said, that's, that's also explainable by just numerical artifacts or error. And so I don't, I don't, I don't have an opinion whether it happens or not yet. I would love to see it happen. I mean, we won't, but I, I don't think we've ruled it out. But what kind of numerics did you do there and what controls the error of that numerics? Um, well, that's it. The error essentially that we're seeing is how good your DMRG is, but also, like I mentioned, we also need that constraint that that thing is the identity. And the problem with the method that we have is when we, when you vectorize these Majorana operators in the way we do, you don't, you kind of lose the matrix structure that, that, that's kind of there. And so that property that it squares the identity becomes a very difficult thing to actually encode into the system. So we didn't have that actively in there. And we could kind of measure it and see what it was, uh, how far away from the identity it was, let's say. Um, and it was of the order of the, of the kind of, of what, the, of what this CHI-2 measure error that we're seeing. So it's it's reasonable that that could be the that that could be an explanation for why we didn't see anything. It could be that we just didn't push our stuff up to a uh, high enough bond dimension. The one I showed you was only sixty four, but we went up to two five six and didn't see anything either. So well, no, it should be uh, yeah. If it should be if it's some kind of MBL stuff, uh, sixty four should be more than enough. But uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Should I mean, I, I recall there was a paper by um, Yehuda Altman and Ashwin Vishwanath on uh, like a clustered model with disorder, mm. which also has edge modes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they, they seem in that paper, they just seem to kind of confirm the usual story that uh, once you crank up disorder and you go to finite energy density, you find the degeneracy in the entanglement spectrum, blah, 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 all the usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for this measure, like I said, we didn't see it. Um, we thought it'd be, a, be an interesting measure because 
I mean, just of this picture of this, this kind of duality between local kind of in configuration space kind of structures and whether or not this thing. So we thought we might see some tightening in those structures too. I mean, the other measure we were hoping to see was that we'd actually, that disorder would, would prevent the weights in these kind of three particle, five particle configurations. So somehow in, really in that kind of Fox based localization sense. And, and, and we didn't really see that either. So, but again, it's, it's, um, it's maybe something to go back to. I mean, uh, Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, maybe I'll stop the recording and then uh, maybe people will be less shy to uh, ask some questions. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.